their visual art and some of their religious ideas and they overlap into the into the Van der Vogel movement of the 19th century where large numbers of youths would move around the countryside it was almost like an alternative society movement much of which prefigured German involvement in the Foreign Legion in paramilitary organisations in the enormous volunteering across the German speaking parts of Central Europe for the Kaiser's armies in 1914 and thereafter and it's quite clear that this is the area of culture that Cyberberg wishes to concentrate on to do, he did another famous documentary of Cosimo Wagner which caused enormous problems for the Bayreuth festival and enormous problems for her family because he kept the microphone on after the interviews had left but he did it with her consent because the microphone's in front of her and she talks and she talks and she talks and then after a certain gap she starts talking about Adolf Hitler and she talked about Adolf Hitler for four hours without a break and quite a lot of this found this into what would then be the final cut of the film and the family went absolutely berserk when this film was distributed and Cyberberg was blackballed from, he was never allowed to attend the festival again and um, it was a scandal to a degree, although the scandal was slightly undercut by the fact that he was regarded as a, as a revealer of, everything, of something that had been widely known anyway. In other words, that she was extremely um, sympathetic. But also that he, Hitler had once told her that Wagnerism was his religion, or the nearest that he ever came to one. Now, Hitler cost £100,000 to make in 1978 or 77 prior to its release in 78 you can get it on the internet it takes ages to download because it's seven hours and therefore most people just give up but it is there <laughs> up on the internet and the BBC part financed it which is truly extraordinary in certain respects but this is because of the disjunction between Western German culture and the rest of the West, even the rest of the NATO West, of which West Germany was indisputably a part at that time. And not just East Germany, not just the Germany that existed before the collapse and destruction, but the difference between, say, the Anglophone world within the West and Germany proper, however defined in the multiple ways I've just delineated. So, from the English BBC sort of viewpoint, the Germans were living an unmastered past. No one would talk about this material. Here is a man who's prepared to make a virtually eight-hour film about it. Therefore, give him some money, a £50,000, quite a lot of money in the 1970s, oh. but not an unbelievable amount for a state broadcaster. And it's true that in the 70s, very few people would deal with any of this material at all. Indeed, he was so short of actors that in the final sequence, the fourth quarter, is divided into four pillars, four sections, we children of hell is the fourth one. Puppets appear. And when somebody asked him why he used puppets, he said, well, I run out of actors. <laughs> so, now, the thing about this film is it is quite visually extraordinary because it's based in one set. Um, if you've ever seen Derek Jarman, uh, Jarman's film Caravaggio, which is in Latin, it's set in one set, which of course means that from a cost basis, you can keep cost to an absolute minimum. And you can also perhaps film for a month, seal it up, three months later you come back and in some respect everything's still in situ. Now, I think it's Paul Langlois, the uh, French set designer, had a lot to do with the set uh, because it's noticeable that a lot of back projection is used because it's a very theatrical film. And for a long time it was treated as essentially an avant-garde and a modernistic film because it's not narrative based, it's episodic, it's slightly mannerist, it superficially appears to be very anti, whereas its real crime is neutrality about matters that you can't be neutral about, not in the contemporary uh, or postmodern Federal Republic. Aesthetically, the uh, Cyberbirds in love, um, not with a particular government between 33 and 45, but with the aesthetics from which it originated. He's a sort of Germanic race soul artist, really. Um, of that sort of yearning, transcendental and instrumental spirituality which you sense uh, the Germans as possibly the primary, central, <coughs> originating 
European character reference possesses. And he wants to go to those areas that contemporary Germany has cast as off limits to most of its artists and writers since the war. Why is this important? It's important because, as Ezra Pound said, uh, genuine creators are the antennae of their entire populations. If you want to find the contemporary art that's art in the broadest of senses, but I mean creation that has a social dimension, if you want to find that in a society that's deracinated or broken down or self-questioning, doubts everything about itself, doubts everything about its past, which is why it doubts its present moment, and so on, you'll find the sort of art that's epitomised by something like the Turner Prize. Whereas if you look at the sort of art that he's dealing with, you see a more communitarian, more organic, more restorationist art, art that's closer to contemporary, uh, to representational fantasy in the mind and beyond it. Dream is extraordinarily important to Cyberberg um, because he believes that in a sense the real truths are deeper than reason, which is why he is a quasi-religious artist, whatever his actual statements about religion may be. We know quite a bit about his actual views, something that many artists don't put on record either because they don't have them in a formal way, or because if they do, they reveal too much and it's difficult to get funding and this and that. Because he wrote a book in 1990 called The Fortunes and Misfortunes of Artists in Germany After the Second War. Now this is a remarkable book, but we need to discuss Hitler in detail before we come on to it. The film uh, stars an actor called Heinz Schubert. It also stars Cyberberg himself in the fourth quadrant and his own daughter, various puppets and minor figures. The first section deals with Hitler's personality cult. The second section deals with Volkish Romanticism in the 19th century. The third section deals with the Shoah, <coughs> particularly as it's seen from Himmler's perspective. The fourth section deals with the aftermath and the generation who feels it with incredible acuteness because Cyberberg's generation mentally comes of age in the immediate aftermath of these events. So for them, the year zero for Germany is the beginning of adult consciousness with an occupied society that's divided hemispherically in accordance with the two world blocks and hyperpowers that then exist. There is a collection of short stories um, written by a young German who died relatively soon after the war called Wolfgang Borsche, um, which Calder published in the 1960s. Is, is, I think it's Germany in the Ruins, something like that. And it's largely the stories of people scampering about to survive living in cellars, shooting rats, uh, there's no water, uh, there's no electricity. During these three years, between 45 and 48, about at least two million Germans died during that period because there was very little food. Uh, parts of the Morganfeld plan were implemented in certain sections of American zone of occupation. Other American commanders were completely opposed to that plan and subverted it. So it was a mixed picture. But nevertheless, at least according to the contemporary German historical record, two million Germans perished during that time. Nearly always the people, liberals say they came most about, the weakest, the illest, the oldest, women, children, the infirm, and so forth. Now, Cyberberg's mental for space of reference, if you like, in terms of maturation, his immediate pre-adult to adult beginnings is that. And yet, he is a anti-realist and a luscious romantic of the most extreme and German type in a way that almost strikes the slightly ironic attitude that the English always partly have to things as very Teutonic, almost overbearing in its seriousness, the seriousness of its sort of pietistic romance. At the end of his career, his last major fictional film was a Wagner's opera Parsifal with an extraordinary performance um, as the female lead country in that opera. 